So welcome everyone for this week's Rising Tide Foundation lecture, where we have the great pleasure of having our, our close friend, Irene Eckert, who will be uh, shedding some light on some underappreciated elements of our, I wanna call it recent history. I, I don't know, it depends subjectively on how you feel about uh, the past 80 years. Um, let's call it recent history. And uh, in the last couple of lectures, uh, since we've ended our Earth's Next 100 Year Symposium, uh, we've been able to get better penetrating insight by Martin Seif into the ugly, sordid mind and heart of Winston Churchill as a representative of something that should have uh, gone extinct a long time ago, but still holds on uh, to humanity. Uh, we've had a wonderful presentation last week by uh, Dirk Polman on uh, the real dynamics behind the assassination and cover-up of Alfred Herrhausen the president of Deutsche Bank, uh, who had a grand vision for the post-1989 period, which was subverted by forces, which if you've seen that documentary or that, that class, you will, you will know about. Um, Dirk will also be publishing a book in the next month or two um, on that story in greater detail. <clears throat> Today, we have the great pleasure, like I said, of learning about another dimension of what the hell happened with the Cold War. What exactly was this weird weird thing that we all sort of take for granted it we're told it just happened world war ii happened and then there was a cold war and our enemies shifted from germany and the axis uh into russia and the the big bad soviet dictatorships and that's just the way it was and almost everything that was done throughout uh, cia covert clandestine operations assassinations coups you name it everything is kind of justified uh from mk ultra to all sorts of weird operations inside of the United States and beyond, everything is justified because there was a higher evil called communism and, the, and Russia and the Soviet Union that had to be stopped no matter what for, the, for a higher good to happen. So anyway, that, that, th there's a lot of narratives, mythologies and lies that we've been fed. None of that had to happen. Um, Irene uh, has been a researcher, a historian. Uh, she's been a teacher for many, many years in Germany, teaching literature, history, and uh, has been an anti-nuclear war activist, a peace activist for a very long time, too, lecturing around the world. She's the editor-in-chief of the Arbeitskreis uh, for Peace Policy in Nuclear-Free Europe, um, which is a great website. I'll put a little link in the description box of this video for people who want to check out her website and, her, and more of her work. Uh, she's been a great friend of Cynthia and myself now for well over a year, and, and I'm very happy that everyone else is going to be able to also make friends with Irene. So, Irene, thank you so much for taking the time. It's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, Cynthia, for giving me the opportunity uh, to talking to you. <clears throat> and thank you very much for uh, all uh, those who are tuned in and um, take time this um in this Christmas season uh, to share the Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening with mm. all of us. And I would like, before I, um, before I step into the matter, I would like to take uh, uh, the opportunity to pay tribute to somebody who is very dear to my heart. And it is, um, I hope you can see that. It is Julian Assange. Can you see uh, the picture? Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Julian Assange, uh, um, uh, a, a courageous journalist, and I would call him a colleague, a, a courageous journalist, a brave man who has been deprived of his freedom for more than 10 years by now. And uh, what I find uh, extremely uh, cynical uh, that on two days ago on... Um, December 10th, United Nations uh, Human Rights Day, a new verdict was put out against him that might um, uh, uh, cause his death in case he is extradited to the United States, who after all is behind all the accusations, false accusations against him. He's he has been charged for treason and spying and uh, 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 what has he done? He has exposed the war crimes committed uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And in so far, he should merit uh, the um, Nobel Peace Award as a colleague of him about a hundred years ago, 
whom you might know or maybe not, uh, uh, a German journalist by the name of Karl von Osiecki. Has any one of you ever heard the name Karl von Osiecki? I haven't. Interesting, you never heard that name and he should remember it always in connection with uh, Julian Assange because he was accused of exactly the same kind of crime he didn't commit, namely treason and spying. And what did he do? It was a journalist who edited a, a wonderful magazine called Die Weltbühne. And for that magazine, great German writers would contribute like Erich Kästner, uh, Kurt Tucholsky, Erich Mühsam, Bruno Frey. Um, and uh, 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 Tuchol um, sorry, uh, Karl von Osiecki was uh, put into jail just like, <laughs> just like Julian Assange under a democratic regime before the Nazis had seized power, but he was released uh, through a, a Christmas amnesty in December 1932, only to be put in prison again uh, shortly after, not in prison, but incarcerated in concentration camps after uh, the Reichstag's fire, uh, February, 27th in 1933. Um, even during the night, he was um, he was taken and he was being put uh, under torture and, and, and thrown uh, into several different concentration camps. But he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1936 uh, through an international campaign in that case successful, and he had to be released by the Nazis um, due to that uh, uh, award. But of course, he was put under custody, he was put under Gestapo surveillance, and only his wife could see him and he would die soon after. So um, the Nobel Peace Prize didn't help him much. And um, Still, he was a liberal journalist, somebody who fought for peace and against rearmament, so, uh, like so many others who paid their courageous citizens' uh, activities uh, with a heavy uh, uh, either death toll or, or torture or whatever. And you will see the connection that um, exists between uh, the fate of these two courageous uh, citizens uh, of the world, I would call him, uh, them, uh, and the, um, the uh, subject of my talk, which is correcting false narratives um, during uh, post-war, World War II uh, period, correcting false negatives, because as um, Matthew often mentions, and as he mentioned in the introduction, um, narratives, myths, storytelling, framing, wording, um, ideas are the battlefield that is overestimated, uh, underestimated very often. And um, we are, um, uh, we see uh, 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 courageous uh, citizens, patriots, um, who um, devote their, their lives to the, the uh, because they want to disseminate uh, uh, news and who want to, uh, by their, by their uh, uh, intellectual or, or poetic contribution, uh, uh, try to contribute to the construction uh, uh, of a a better society or to edify just people and to, to inspire uh, uh, them to become better individuals. And those are very often those who are being, or most of the time, those who are being targeted as, as uh, to be, uh, uh, well, di disposed of. And uh, it's, it's a little bit like comparable with nations, nations who are in reality showing a, a better uh, uh, way of um, constructing a society or uh, make a cooperative effort uh, uh, and, and stretch out their hand uh, to other nations and want to, uh, to uh, um, 
to build a peaceful uh, world, they are treated as enemies and they are being uh, portrayed to us as the most evil uh, um, uh, societies or creatures or nations, nations in the world. And I would like to show you um, a book of which I have drawn a lot of, uh, a lot of information and it is David Talbot, The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, the CIA and the Rise of the American Secret Government. Because such a, um, such a secret government uh, does exist and uh, uh, even if those who uh, would uh, uh, point out to it uh, would most often be portrayed as conspiracy theorists, it is also important to know that even the term conspiracy theorists was created by the CIA in 1967 in order to, <laughs> in order to shy off or denounce critics of the Warren report that dealt with the murder of John F. Kennedy and uh, spun the story of the single-handed murderer. But um, I want to go back, I want to uh, take you back to the year 1945, which would have been, which would have given the possibility to humankind to create a better world after uh, such heavy death toll and who would, um, especially as far as Germany is concerned, uh, 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 would be, um, a good starting point because uh, the allied uh, who defeated Hitler, uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, Great Britain, um, showed that it was, or, or it showed, yes, to the world that it was possible to cooperate if you have um, a, a reasonable approach to policy and if you do away with easy, uh, coined enemy images and um, in um, 1945 uh, we, we saw the Potsdam conference in um, in Babelsberg in in, uh, in, um, in Germany near Berlin and uh, there you had uh, the three representatives Churchill and uh, Stalin and um, uh, Truman, who represented the United States. And the Potsdam Conference uh, was sort of the last gathering that came out with a very constructive proposal, an agreement that would have uh, provided ample means for a more, more uh, peaceful um, post-war policy, but it was not uh, enforced, unfortunately. I would like you to remember that on April 12th, 1945, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt died a premature death. And that uh, would have uh, enormous consequences for the post-war policies because even while he was alive, um, a very influential figure, a gray eminence of US uh, policy uh, by the name of Alan Dulles uh, would already work behind the scenes and uh, see to it that um, uh, the agreements that uh, um, uh, Roosevelt had forged even before the Potsdam Conference in Yalta and in Casablanca, which would imply that there should be no separate peace, that there should be due uh, pros, uh, uh, the, 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 the high ranking SS and uh, Nazi criminals should be put to trial and should see uh, due process. And uh, Germany uh, would have to be democratized and um, uh, that uh, uh, the great powers would uh, work together in order to help uh, construct um, uh, a future uh, uh, society without uh, uh, deviations like um, uh, the NS um, regime had brought about humanity. 
But Alan Dulles um, did not have a high opinion of Roosevelt. On the contrary, he considered him to be a dirty commie who would cooperate with another dirty commie, of course, uh, the Soviet representative that's, that was Stalin in those days. And um, uh, Alan Dulles uh, was one of those, um, well, political characters that acted out, um, well, they didn't, they, they were not elected uh, uh, po political representatives, but they acted in the interest of certain circles that uh, would be interested <laughs> that the war would continue and uh, that would have cooperated with the um, Nazis all the time during the war. And uh, Alan Dulles was already uh, sent to Germ uh, to not to Germany but to Europe in um, in uh, uh, just before the U.S. entered the First World War, and he would have is he would have established an office in Bern, which is the capital of Switzerland, and um, he would have acted from there as a um, kind of a spider network. He was uh, the head of the uh, uh, foreign of cultural uh, of, sorry, he was the head of the uh, um, office of foreign relations. He was uh, the head of the office of strategic services, a predecessor of the CIA. He was the first director of the CIA. And um, he would uh, 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 have um, ties with friends and foes going in and out the office in Geneva. But what is uh, uh, more, um, immediately after the war had ended, after the defeat of the uh, German uh, Wehrmacht, um, Alan Dulles even uh, had secret arrangements uh, with um, a high ranking SS officer in Italy and against uh, the agreements uh, of the Allies, he uh, saw to it that a separate peace deal was done with Karl Friedrich Wolf, with him, with whom he established friendly ties. But what is even more uh, uh, um, crucial to the post-war development was that Alan Dulles established ties, uh, very friendly ties, with Reinhard Gehlen. Has anyone of you ever heard of Reinhard Gehlen? Okay, <laughs> of course, Cynthia, you have, and some others have. Reinhard Gehlen was the master spy of Hitler. He was um, active uh, in Eastern Europe. He was the head of Fremde Heere Ost, uh, the Eastern Central Spy Agency. But he was, did not only spy and watch out for the weak, uh, uh, weaker um, uh, parts of the Soviet defense, but he also committed crimes such as, and I even would like to, to quote that, Galen's um, agency also pinpointed the location of Jews, communists, and other enemies of the Reich in the bloodlands overrun by Hitler's forces so that they could be rounded up and executed by the Einsatzgruppen death squads. And um, this is a quotation from David Talbot, The Devil's Chessboard. And uh, Reinhard Gehlen uh, was uh, like uh, many other uh, uh, such like individuals. He was brought to the United States immediately after the war. And there he was briefed, uh, like for example, um, Werner von Braun was, and others who were then sent back to Germany. In the case of Reinhard Gehlen, he was sent to Bavaria, to a place called Pullach near Munich, where he set up uh, an intelligent German intelligence agency under the auspices of the US Army. And later in uh, 1956, 55 even, after West Germany had joined the aggressive NATO alliance and had um, rearmed the German army uh, 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 under the Adenauer regime, uh, Reinhard Gehlen was sent to Bonn where he official, officially uh, headed 
the Bundesnachrichtendienst that he, uh, of course, built up, Bundesnachrichtendienst, the Federal Agency for Intelligence, Foreign uh, Intelligence Agency of Federal Germany. But he was not the only, uh, he was not the only um, uh, high ranking NS liaison that acted under Alan uh, uh, Dulles uh, guidance, Hans Glopke, he was the first chief of the chancellery of, um, of Adenauer. And uh, uh, he uh, sort of ran the, the chancellery um, for a very long period of time. And Adenauer himself, by the way, was, um, uh, was um, of course established, uh, uh, well established in office by the help of his American friends. So why was that so, um, uh, so negative? Why did all this have uh, such extremely negative uh, consequences for the, uh, uh, up to this very day, if you want so, where we again are confronted with an enemy image, uh, uh, which would sort of bring us to the brink of a, 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 a new hot war between um, Western and Eastern uh, uh, Europe between uh, uh, NATO and Russia, if uh, the Russian would not uh, would not be uh, would not be so so careful and would not have such a um, such an intelligent diplomat uh, in the in in the prime position uh, uh, as uh, Vladimir Putin is, but. Um, let me again go back to 1945. Uh, um, I told you about the Potsdam Conference. I told you about the influence of uh, Alan Dulles at the beginning. Um, and um, I also would like to mention that Churchill, who was put out of office and replaced at the Potsdam Conference by Attlee, very soon, um, uh, traveled to the United States and met with his friend uh, uh, in spirits, Truman, and worked out um, a speech that would have enormous consequences on the post-war uh, policy. The speech was uh, given in Fulton, Missouri. Has any one of you uh, still some kind of memory of that, of the, of the relevance of that speech? Okay, some have. Um, of course, um, we, I, I mean, I am a uh, um, post-war generation, and of course, we didn't learn about these things. We did not even learn about the uh, um, importance of, of Churchill's speech, even uh, though it was given in '46 in the immediate post-war area. But um, we were fed with, with a... Uh, um, well, I, I also should, should mention that only recently I learned that Churchill actually in a letter in 1940 uh, stated that Great Britain would not um, fight against uh, Germany. They would not fight against Hitler. They would not fight, sorry, they would not fight against Hitler. They would not even fight against the the spirit of national socialism, they would rather fight against the spirit, spirit of Friedrich Schiller so they, that it would never um, show up again. And the consequences of such political leaders having, having um, influence through speeches and, and backstage diplomacy on the official policy was that we, as a post-war generation in West Germany, were told uh, liberation of, um, not, uh, of fascism never happened. Fascism never even existed. What existed was two barbarian monsters like Hitler and Stalin. And of course, they had to be done away with very quickly. And um, after they were gone and after uh, uh, Goebbels, uh, the, um, the head of the German propaganda machinery had taken the pill, the, the same pill as Hitler, uh, they committed suicide. And in Goebbels case, even um, he took his entire family, including the five children with him. After them gone, the 
NS propaganda machine didn't exist anymore. And after uh, SS Führer uh, um, of the Reich, Himmler, had committed suicide, his machinery was supposedly gone too. And after Göring, the Reichsminister for Aviation, Minister of the Reich for Aviation, had committed suicide, although he was tried at the, in Nuremberg for having committed um, war crimes, um, he uh, also took uh, cyanide, which was, by the way, provided by Alan Dulles and his friends, because hanging would have been a too, too humiliating a death form. So we were fed with this kind of black milk of propaganda, uh, the, the fascism uh, uh, in, in really never had existed. What had existed was totalitarianism and under totalitarianism, the um, uh, uh, Soviets, the Soviet regime, socialism uh, uh, was equal equalized or put on equal terms with uh, Nazi uh, uh, socialism. And uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the blame shifting or the enemy uh, shifting was already well underway. And the term fascism was more and more um, uh, exclusively, exclusively used, excuse me, by citizens of the GDR. But I didn't even talk about the separation of my country. We were, of course, also taught that the separation of Germany was the fact, was in fact committed by the evil Russians. The Russians had uh, divided uh, Germany. The, the Russians had uh, uh, put on a hunger blockade on, Ber uh, on the Berliners. The Russians uh, had, um, had dropped an iron curtain over Eastern Europe and uh, the Russians uh, uh, were, well, they were an evil bunch altogether. And um, the reality uh, was a little bit different uh, the, the term Iron Curtain was used in Churchill's speech, Fulton's speech, in order to put the blame um, for uh, the, the, uh, the development that later indeed uh, 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 led to, to a division in Europe exclusively to the Russians. And the term uh, um, Iron Curtain, which is not very much known, was a term uh, out of the toolbox of Goebbels. Goebbels had used that term in order to denounce the agreements of Yalta and uh, uh, um, had already framed uh, uh, that kind of ag agreements would lead to an iron curtain, curtain uh, being dropped across Europe. And um, of course, the reality uh, was a little bit different, but that uh, we only learned very much later, the reality was um, that the Russians, in fact, had come as liberators. The Russians had uh, opened up Auschwitz and exposed the crimes committed there uh, to, the, to the world. The Russians um, had not dropped bombs over German cities like the Brits and the United States uh, uh, had done, but they had lost millions of young soldiers' lives and hundreds of thousands of lives uh, conquering eventually Berlin. And immediately after, uh, after the defeat of the Wehrmacht, the, uh, the, the, the Russians in, in Berlin they had started to reconstruct uh, the infrastructure. They had uh, saw to it that um, the people were hungry, people uh, were fed. And um, uh, for example, this, uh, this is well documented and well uh, uh, through oral history uh, handed over knowledge. My father and my grandfather had survived uh, the bombing of Berlin and my husband had survived the bombing of Berlin. And they, uh, uh, my husband told me like there were posters in the, in the, um, in the cities of Berlin uh, put up uh, by the Russians 
uh, Hitler's come and go away, but the German people is to stay. This was the kind of attitude that the Russians uh, would, um, would bring. And uh, the first city commander, uh, uh, Bersarin, who was um, uh, quite uh, highly appreciated by the Berliners and who still is an honorary citizen of Berlin. After a while, they, uh, for a moment, they tried to even uh, take him off that list of honorary citizens, but he has been put there again. Bersarin, the first city commander of Berlin, he died very quickly uh, in, a, in, a, in a mysterious motorcycle accident. And um, what, what was then a sort of fed to, to the Germans was that the, the, the Russians were rapists. Now, of course, with an army uh, uh, that had uh, come to defeat uh, uh, Hitler and, and, and the Wehrmacht and with all the crimes that had been committed, uh, on, on, on Soviet soil, it is easy to imagine that some uh, Russian soldiers would also have raped uh, a German uh, uh, women. But what, what was done in order to forge the enemy image and to, to blacken the image of the liberator that was still in people's minds immediately after the war was to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to spread the image of the, of, the, of the Russians as rapists. And this was, um, of course, um, not a difficult job to, uh, with, when you owned uh, the, the media machine and when you had at your disposal uh, experts in, in, in propaganda like uh, Reinhard Gehlen and his crew, uh, you could easily uh, work on uh, the um, reanimating the enemy image. Uh, and uh, 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 of course, um, one of the techniques uh, being used was that um, somebody like <laughs> Reinhard Gehlen knew how to, to use uh, intellectuals and use how to, uh, knew how to use brains. Um, uh, uh, creative uh, uh, German uh, um, intellectuals who had been in exile in the United States and who were true pa patriots and uh, opponents against the Nazi regime and who had become US uh, citizens and who joined the US army even in order to help defeat the Nazis. And I want to just mention some very famous names like um, the children of Thomas Mann, Erika Mann, uh, the author of Mephisto or um, Klaus Mann, the author of his, uh, Mephisto, his sister Erika Mann, who was also a prolific writer, and Stefan Heim, Stefan Heim, who was an, a Jewish uh, uh, author who, who wrote in English. Uh, his first novel uh, was immediately put into a film under the Roosevelt era, and he wrote another important uh, novel, The Crusaders, that even uh, won appreciation of the New, New York Times. These intellectuals, they were, they, they went, they came with the uh, US Army as, as part of the liberator, uh, alleged liberators to Germany. And they were uh, very soon treated uh, by um, Alan Dulles and his likes as disposable elements. They were pushed aside and some of them uh, ended tragically like uh, Klaus Mann, he committed suicide in the South of France later. But, uh, those um, writers were not really, they would have wanted to help create a better society to contribute to, to edify the spirit of the, the terrible experience of the war and with all the brain drain that uh, um, Germany had experienced because hundred, hundreds of or thousands of uh, 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 intellectuals had um, fled into exile. People <clears throat> like um, Stefan Heim or, or the Mann uh, children or Bertolt Brecht, Anna Segers and many others uh, 
uh, uh, would also those who would come back from Moscow exile, like Erich Weinert or Johannes R. Becher, they, they, they had come with uh, a heart full of good intentions. They wanted to help create a, a better society in Germany and to, uh, to fight back the barbarian spirit that still occupied the minds and hearts of many German people. But they were sidelined and uh, uh, some like Stefan Heim, Bert Brecht, Anna Segers, of course, they went then to the eastern part uh, of Germany to the for later GDR. And others that were cherished by Ellen uh, Dallas, for example, um, you probably won't th know the name, but he was quite uh, uh, well known in the post-war area. Uh, by the, uh, uh, his name is uh, Hans Werner Richter. Of course, he didn't produce a very um, uh, creative and important literature. His basic um, achievement was that he was a Trotskyite and that he was uh, an anti-Soviet. And he was taken as a, a, a prisoner of war uh, immediately after the defeat and was taken like Reinhard Gehlen and Werner von Braun and others. He was taken to the US and he was briefed there. And then he was sent back and, um, <laughs> and equipped with ample means uh, financial means. Uh, he was funded by the uh, Ford Foundation to create a literary circle with, um, well, one could dispute about uh, the uh, literary relevance of, of the, um, the uh, people he, he gathered, but um, he invited uh, literary uh, interest people who were uh, supposed themselves as poets or writers, they were invited under the auspices of uh, the Found Found Foundation, of course, nobody knew that, uh, by um, a person who was absolutely not known at the time, Hans-Werner Richter, uh, to castles and uh, to, to, to nice assemblies, and they were invited to read their poetry there. And there was even a literary prize that was um, uh, that was uh, created in 1950, the Georg Büchner Prize. And you know, the first one who was uh, given that prize was uh, uh, was Ben Gottfried Ben, who was of course an opportunist and had worked with the Nazis. And his the, the kind of poetry he um, he wrote was. Uh, in terms of the human image she presented was very negative. And um, another one was Günther Eich. Uh, he wrote la verses like, um, think of it, uh, human is the enemy of the human. Think of it wherever you go, think of it in Israel and think of it at this, under a summer sky. I mean, such, such something like that was supposed to be poetry, and uh, in 1952, he was awarded the Büchner Prize. Büchner Prize. I don't know if anyone of you uh, remembers Georg Büchner. He was a contemporary of Heinrich Heine in the early 19th century, and he was a social critic and a, a great, um, a great uh, uh, writer. And um, this kind of policy, uh, uh, of course, to, to influence the intellectuals, the literary uh, situation in Germany was based on another uh, uh, strange narrative. I mean, strange uh, for, for those who were interested in um, keeping Germany low on the one side, intellectually low, but on the other side, to upkeep it as a bulwark uh, against the Russians again. Of course, it was um, an interesting narrative. It was the narrative of the Our Zero. Our Zero meant that nothing had happened before. Our Zero, Ground Zero, Germany was to be treated as if it was a colony, uh, uh, as if there had never been a cultural nation, as as if great German poets, and there I come back to Churchill's quote at the beginning, great German poets like Friedrich Schiller 
uh, would have never uh, existed before. On the other side, um, of course, there was East Germany to be um, to come into existence uh, soon as a as a as a state too, because uh, the state. Uh, uh, the Adenauer state that was cherished and, and, and uh, as I said, uh, well supported by ex-Nazis and uh, also with the helping hand of Alan Dulles and his likes. Um, and of course also uh, uh, provided with ample means of the Marshall Fund. Um, that also, oh, Uh, am I too fast or? No. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Marshall Fund money, of course, helped West Germany exclusively in order to develop what later was known as the um, economic miracle. But uh, uh, the, the Federal Republic of Germany that was governed by Adenauer until 1963 uh, of course, uh, only uh, consisted of two thirds of the uh, of of the former Germany. Um, the other part <clears throat> that was um, still under Soviet administration uh, was as a as a response to the creation of uh, the Adenauer state was established then um, under the name of German Democratic Republic. And as I already mentioned. There were quite a number of um, um, intellectuals, of writers, poets who decided under the given circumstances to uh, seek a new home in, um, in the eastern part of Germany. And the first president, the minister president of the GDR was um, an ex-social democrat by the name of Otto Grotewohl. And he, uh, for example, um, represented a completely different mindset than that of Adenauer, when, for example, he spoke to the young generation that to upkeep uh, the grace of humanity would now be put in, you, in your hands, young people, and please uh, take it and cherish it. And of course, he quoted Friedrich Schiller's words, but we in the West would never heard hear <clears throat> such like um, uh, 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 quotes from somebody uh, representing uh, the eastern half of our country, we were exclusively taught that um, everything that happened in the east was evil. And um, I don't know if you can imagine that uh, uh, the eastern part of, of, of Germany, of course, that was not just um, some other country. It was our ex-neighbors, it was our families. Uh, the entire family of my mother was in um, East Germany, for example, and I hardly knew, uh, I, I hardly knew my aunts and my relatives there. Um, because my mother had gone, had left her family when she was very, very young and had um, traveled to, 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 to the south of Germany. But she didn't do that because she want, wanted to escape an evil regime. Uh, she just wanted to get away from her family and she was an adventurer and so on. But later, of course, this, the story would have been spun because it was advent advantageous that, of course, there was this repressive regime in the East and you better went West because uh, uh, that would uh, mean freedom. <laughs> in reality, uh, the situation was, uh, was uh, a little different. For example, the, um, another part of, of the policy of, of, um, of uh, uh, Alan uh, Dallas meddling in cooperation with the ex-Nazis was that those people, uh, and there were a lot of them, who, uh, who would devote their, their lives to the, the, the construction of a better, a more peaceful, a more just, a more um, cooperative society, um, 
they would not, uh, and they, of course, they didn't want uh, the, the, the division of Germany to continue. They would want to see their, their, their family members and so on. And they would, these people uh, who, who would struggle for peace, cooperation, um, unification of Germany, you can hardly imagine that they were treated as, treat, as traitors, just in the way as Julian Assange and Karl von Osiecki are being treated, just in the way those who organized um, uh, the movement for reunification, the movement against the rearmament of Germany that took place, by the way, immediately after uh, the Adenauer regime was installed in 1949, uh, there was an enormous peace movement uh, against these efforts to rearm Germany. Even, uh, even um, uh, a well-known uh, Christian democratic minister by the name of Franz Josef Strauss would have said in 1945 that uh, he who will ever take up an arm should lose his hand. And I mean, there was an enormous um, uh, 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 preparedness to to go out in the streets even and to to uh, to show um, your uh, um, uh, your uh, anti-war sentiment and there was an international movement the World Peace Council there was the Stockholm appeal, appeal for peace and so on but those who supported it in West Germany um, were prosecuted they were put on trial, they were, there were hundreds of thousands of preliminary, um, how do you say that, prosecutions opened uh, within, um, between 19, uh, uh, 1950 and 1968. And this is very well documented by a person, a, a lawyer, Dieter Possa. Can you see that? Dieter Possa, uh, law, Attorney in the Cold War, German history in political uh, uh, criminal um, procedures between 1951 and 1968. Dieter Posser was um, the colleague and uh, companion of Gustav Heinemann. Gustav Heinemann was a Christian democratic politician who uh, at the beginning uh, was a member of the Adenauer uh, government. He, uh, he served as the Minister of the Interior, but he was then, he stepped back because he was against rearmament of Germany and he was also an attorney. And uh, together with Dieter Posser, they defended so many, so many uh, Germans, West German citizens who were who were prosecuted and uh, for treason and and for for spying and for cooperating with the enemy who was living in the other part of our country, among them and of course they were all denounced uh, and labeled and stigmatized as communists and many of them probably were, but the, among them were prestigious or noble women like for example Clara Maria Fassbender. Professor Clara Maria Fassbender. She was a, a, a she taught Roman languages and methodology of history, and she lost under the Adenauer early Adenauer days. She lost her teaching position. She lost her teaching position again, which she already had lost under the Nazis because he opposed the NS regime. Clara Maria Fassbender was um, uh, she was charged with uh, <laughs> with a very special crime because she wanted to make to reach out a hand to France and to the Soviet Union. She was later awarded um, a very high price under de Gaulle, but she was prosecuted and she lost her citizens' rights and and so on. Uh, in the early Adenauer era. And um, she's maybe only the most prominent uh, person, but I want to give you another example. A simple woman by the name of Gertrud Schröter. Gertrud Schröter was a housewife, a mother. Um, 
she had already uh, served a prison, uh, a prison sentence under the Nazis, and she was prosecuted again for what crime uh, in the early uh, Adenauer days, she had organized holidays, holidays for children of poor families who had been invited by the GDR government to spend their holidays in the GDR. That was supposed to be treacherous, that was supposed to be a crime. And uh, uh, she was sentenced, uh, uh, I, I think, for five years of prison. She lost her citizens' rights, she lost her pension rights, uh, and um, uh, uh, pension rights, that means she lost uh, the privileges that was uh, first um, given to her because she had already suffered under the NS regime. I mean, it's, it's, it's from today, it's hard to believe that things like that could happen in uh, allegedly a democratic a German society after the defeat of the, um, of the NS regime. But uh, it is well documented what I'm telling you. It is, um, uh, it is part of our history that was hardly known. Um, well, when I studied, for example, in the 70s, I studied political science and you could do well in political science with, uh, without even have heard the name of Ellen Dulles, without knowing anything about the prosecution of uh, political prosecution of German citizens under the Adenauer era. And um, eventually uh, that led, uh, that kind of policy and prosecution, uh, of course, was, um, was, was due to the fact that uh, Germany was to enter the aggressive NATO alliance, which took, uh, uh, which happened in um, uh, in 1955. In 1955, against the will of a, of a an enormous amount of people in Germany, uh, the Adenauer uh, Germany entered the aggressive NATO alliance. And of course, uh, the German army was to be rebuilt by former uh, NS generals. Um, and uh, uh, along with that went, as I had already mentioned at the beginning, uh, the fact that Reinhard Gehlen now uh, uh, established the office of the Bundesnachrichtendienst, uh, the uh, uh, German Foreign uh, Intelligence Agency in Bonn, right next to uh, to the government. <clears throat> and in 1956, the German Communist Party was um, was made illegal. And by the way, still illegal up to this very day. The 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 KPD, the Communist Party of Germany, is still illegal in uh, Germany. And uh, what is interesting, uh, what is an interesting contrast to the way the, um, the uh, 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 true patriots and, and uh, proponents for cooperation and peace uh, were treated, I want to give you an, give you an example <clears throat> of how uh, somebody, uh, not so well known as Reinhard Gehlen or Hans Klopke, but uh, quite a high-ranking SS officer who was the right hand, who was the right hand of the commander of the concentration camp in Buchenwald. Buchenwald is near uh, uh, Weimar. Weimar is the cultural city where Schiller and Goethe and Herder uh, uh, had. Um, uh, had uh, had lived and 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 worked Buchenwald Buchenwald the commander the second hand of the commander of Buchenwald his name is Wolfgang Otto this man for having prob most probably arguably murdered the head the the the, the leader of the German uh, Communist Party Tailmann. Uh, quite a famous politician of the Weimar area who even ran for presidency at, at a given point in 1932, by the way, he won millions of votes. Um, Tailmann 
was uh, 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 tortured in, in Buchenwald in the concentration camps and most probably Wolfgang Otto is his murderer. This man was trialed in Nuremberg for having committed um, crimes against humanity, but like so many others, he was released in 1952. He was released and now keep in mind, Clara Maria Fassbender was taken away uh, from uh, her teaching position, but Wolfgang Otto was given a teaching position in Gelden, uh, I think it's uh, in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, a small town in Gelden, North Rhine-Westphalia. And you know what he, what he taught at a grammar school? Religious instructions and history. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-boggling. And is, it is documented by David Talbot, the devil's chessboard, English-speaking literature, but there is, of course, more literature around to document that. And um, uh, uh, all this, we have, to, we have to keep in mind the whole picture. All this was, of course, done in order to, to help um, upkeep the image of the evil enemy. And who was the evil enemy? The evil enemy uh, against whom we would rearm, we would have to rearm, we would have to be uh, uh, on guard, was of course the Russians. The Russians, uh, the Russians who in those days were Soviets. The Soviet Union was not Russia, it was much more, but it was always uh, or very often, most of the time, given the title Russia. And here is another interesting, um, uh, an interesting thing to remember that the image of the evil Russian was actually not even originally coined by the Nazis, by Goebbels and his propaganda machine, but it is a, an, an enemy image that dates back a thousand years. And here I would like to show you, uh, especially for those of you who, who live in Montreal and read French, another important source. It is by Guy Metton. Guy Metton is a um, quite well-known journalist in, in uh, Switzerland. He uh, was the editor of the, of the uh, Tribune de Genève, and he wrote this book, Une guerre de mille ans, uh, a war of 1,000 years, la russophobie de Charlemagne à la crise ukrainienne. La russophobie de Charlemagne à la crise ukrainienne. In English, Russia phobia from Charles, uh, um, Charlemagne, uh, um, Charles the Great, to the Ukrainian crisis, to the Ukrainian crisis why we love to hate the Russians so much. So it is incredible. And I think it um, takes me back to, 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 the, to the topic of my talk, cutting through um, narratives, cutting through um, age old myths of enemy uh, uh, creation seems to me very, very important in order to um, in order to open up our minds and to uh, 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 incapacitate us to develop better relationships and to also um, see or understand the patterns uh, uh, of um, the patterns of mind control and how to dismantle it. And uh, the keyword mind control uh, uh, brings me back to another terrible story that was again inaugurated uh, uh, or supervised by Alan Dulles. That is the uh, MK Ultra program uh, that was started in 1950. Uh, it was a, a, a CIA program under which um, 
people would be treated so in order to completely uh, uh, erase their memory and uh, in order to uh, to help uh, establish their minds as a blank slate and um, uh, uh, as terrible as that is being done to individuals it is equally horrifying if you imagine that such techniques were kind of um, imposed on the on the German nation and of course not only on the German nation but as I'm German and I'm talking about the post-war history of, of uh, uh, Germany uh, uh, this is my subject but uh, actually with with uh, uh, um, with efforts like uh, Hans Werner Richter's uh, group group 74 no group 47 was this literary circle that uh, Hans Werner Richter uh, would establish with the help of the found Ford foundation uh, uh, and and they of course um, would treat uh, the German cultural nation these intellectuals as if it had not existed before and as if the minds of the German cultural nation was a blank slate. Uh, uh, it was um, it was treated like um, it was nobody. And um, like for example, young authors. Uh, I didn't mention uh, um, the name of an author that I, I, I think needs to be mentioned as uh, immediately coming out of the war, a young soldier, somebody who tried to escape uh, uh, his services as a soldier by mutilating himself, and he was of course uh, 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 treated very badly. Uh, therefore, he was a. Um, uh, a young actor and he was a young writer by the name of Wolfgang Borchert and he wrote uh, um, a theater play uh, outside the door which was quite, quite uh, well known after the war he wrote beautiful little uh, uh, short stories and uh, he wrote a pamphlet also against um, against uh, uh, starting a war again literature like that of Wolfgang Borchert was called um, debris, debris literature, uh, trash literature, uh, literature coming out of the ruins uh, in German Trümmer literature, which has this uh, double connotation of coming out of the of the ruins, but also being trash. And uh, uh, others who who bought into that in, into that. Um, unofficial program of the group 47 of course would be treated like a little um well heroes uh, and what i don't want to forget to mention is uh, that um alan dallas had children he was a father of several children and he even exposed his own children to that mk ultra program of the cia his son his son served as a veteran in the uh, Korean War. Uh, sorry, he didn't serve as a veteran, of course, he served in the uh, Korean War. He came back <coughs> with a brain injury and he, he, um, he would be disturbed. And consequently, consequently Alan Dulles <coughs> would see to it that his son would be exposed several times to this um, a new mind control program established by uh, MK Ultra. Again, a story that David Talbot um, writes about uh, uh, in his in his book, The Devil's Chessboard. It must be it must have been very very hard for 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 the young man to uh, to undergo this uh, program. Eventually, he was sent to Switzerland, where, where he was treated more hum humanely. And Ellen Dulles son uh, um, daughter also for other reasons was um, submitted to the program because she uh, had developed a depression and um, <clears throat> yeah that was um, that was some of the <laughs> of the um, uh, here with I, I mentioning some of the tools that were um, that were well how do I put it that were developed exemplified and exerted 
in order to create narratives or to erase narratives which were unwanted. Because, uh, uh, of course, uh, Dallin's son had started to uh, criticize his father and to attack him. Uh, uh, I think even he used terms as an, a Nazi or something like that. Of course, uh, you don't want your children uh, to see you in that light, even if you are Alan Dulles. And um, <clears throat> well, there would be so much more, but I have already spoken uh, uh, so long. Uh, uh, just, uh, just a little bit more about the early 50s. Um, in 1950, the MK Ultra program was established uh, as a mind control program officially by the CIA, uh, admitted. In the same year, 1950, 1950, just one year after the uh, creation of the German um, Adenauer state and in response, the German uh, GDR state in the East. One year later in Berlin, in the uh, sort of capital of the Cold War, you had <laughs> the creation or better inauguration of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. The Congress for Cultural Freedom was inaugurated in Berlin and it was established or equipped better, equipped with ample means, with funds without ending, even more, much, much more funding than the Group 47 under Trotsky, Hans Werner Richter had received. Uh, the Congress of Cultural Freedom. I, 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 I'm curious who of you would have heard of the of this institution, the Congress of Cultural Freedom. Matthew, you have Cynthia. Oh, Paul Fitzgerald. Paula Fitzgerald. Has that, that's also, Liz. Oh, Liz. Sorry, <laughs> it says Paul. Paul Fitzgerald. Well, some of you have heard of it, but you may you may quite as well not. Um, be aware of the whole picture because the culture of the culture for the Congress for Cultural Freedom was uh, was such a vicious institution, such an anti-Soviet institution. But it was much more. It was um, worldwide, worldwide supporting negativity. Like, for example, uh, the, this modernist stream of expressionism to which uh, authors like Sartre, Camus, uh, Simone de Beauvoir in, in France belonged. Um, expressionist literature to which um, probably Gottfried Benn would count himself with his images of negativity. Uh, the, 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 the way uh, the cultural, the Congress for Cultural Freedom influenced thinkers. There is a back, backlash somehow. What do I do to erase that? There is a sound coming back. You hear, you hear a background sound, uh, like static or something? It's a disturbing sound. I hear a disturbing sound. Um, what does it sound like? Because I don't, I don't. Matt, hear Matt, just mute, uh, mute everybody. Because there's um, iPhone 12 that isn't muted. That might be. Oh, okay. A All right. Done and done. Okay. Congress of Cultural Freedom, uh, influencing intellectuals, poets, writers uh, all over the world, but of course, uh, uh, particularly also in Europe not only in Germany, but in Germany, it had its origin origins. I mentioned Camus, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, of course, intellectuals that uh, we have known as belonging to the left, even to uh, adhering to the Communist Party, as far as Sartre and Camus is concerned. But um, many of those intellectuals, for example, also in Germany later, Heinrich Böll, Heinrich Böll, who is um, uh, who was a committed author, a Catholic uh, from the Rhineland, and he wrote many novels. He was later awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. 
like his colleague Günther Grass was, um, I don't know if Günther Grass ever was a victim of the cultural of the Cultural Congress, but Heinrich Böll certainly was. And they often, it was done to them more or less unknowingly. They were invited to congresses. They had, uh, they were sort of uh, awarded literary prizes. They had ample possibilities for publication. And whoever uh, is a writer and wants to publicize knows how difficult it can be to get your stuff published with the, um, with the media in the hands of uh, very few people who uh, at the same time often profit from the war machine. So that was um, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. It's a subject in itself, but um, it was aggressively, aggressively anti-Soviet anti and um, uh, uh, um, yes, I, I should maybe also mention in that context, I mentioned the premature death of Roosevelt in uh, 1944, even before the war had ended. But um, his uh, Soviet counterpart with whom he had, in the name of course of, uh, for his nation, collaborated uh, constructively was Joseph Stalin, who died also a premature death in 1953. Joseph Stalin died in 1953 very timely because in 1952, several notes, several uh, proposals for a peace agreement with Germany, uh, proposals for the unification of Germany under the condition that the entire German nation would not adhere to any um, military pact. That was the only condition. Several pro proposals were, were uh, came out of the Soviet Union in 1952. And um, they were, of course, rejected. And they were, of course, treated as Stalin notes. And um, a ruse of, of the Soviets cannot be anything else but a ruse if it comes out of the Soviet Union. And Stalin died um, in March 53. So uh, with him done away, uh, the Stalin notes were done away and we did not need to take into consideration the peace proposals any further. And up to this very day, uh, I must say, Germany doesn't have a peace treaty. We do not have a peace treaty uh, uh, over 70 years uh, after uh, the Second World War is over, which is quite astonishing. And um, it goes to show how, um, well, how, how the balance of powers was um, distributed in those days. And um, of course, I mentioned earlier that um, that uh, uh, with uh, the monsters, uh, uh, Hitler done away, uh, Stalin done away, uh, the problem would be solved. Only that uh, my personal view is that uh, the two personality cannot be compared on any level, on no level whatsoever, can the two persons that are pre have been uh, over decades presented to us as, as, as partners in crime or as equal monsters uh, uh, can be compared. But that is a whole different um, story to be told another day. And maybe um, I could draw your curiosity to a researcher in the United States, um, Montclair State University. He, he works as an expert for uh, for uh, English uh, literature uh, of the medieval age, but this man uh, uh, also does research into uh, uh, the Soviet era. He speaks Russian and many other languages fluently, among them German. His name is Grover Fur, and he did a lot of research um, in, 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 into, into the way the image of, of Stalin was also uh, sort of um, distorted uh, 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 as a as a black uh, a black legend 
and uh, there is another one other uh, uh, um, historian I know apart from Grover Fur who has digged into that into that black legend he is of Italian origin his name is Domenico Lozudo the end of a black legend is one of his publications he's quite famous you may not know him but he is quite famous in Europe he died also a premature death as far as I'm concerned maybe I may be wrong he was old but um, he uh, uh, he was um, writing more and more interesting uh, literature does anyone know Domenico Lozodo of you is the name familiar with you Elke you must know him um, I, I know him and I appreciate him appreciate you appreciate him <laughs> I, I can imagine yeah well I just want to raise your curiosity because talking about um, exposing false narratives there is so much to be undone there is so much to be undone and um, maybe just to conclude because I've been already talking too long I want to mention a second speech uh, of the post-war era the first one I mentioned was Churchill's Fulton speech, who had terrible consequences because he was the speech uh, that was opening the box of the Cold War and doing away with all the allied uh, uh, cordial uh, attitudes towards each other. The second most very equally important speech, have you ha has anyone an idea of uh, what I would be possibly referring to the second most important speech of the second century of the uh, last century 20th century which was given in the mid 50s it was the speech given by khrushchev nikita khrushchev in 1956 at the 20th party congress of the soviet Communist Party, and uh, it was a, a speech that, interestingly enough, was published first in by the New York Times. Long, well, uh, quite a while before it has been published in the Soviet Union. And uh, it is an interesting subject to analyze that speech and to go deeper into the consequences uh, of that speech would be a, a job for a future historian. Grover has uh, has uh, has um, taken it up, but as far as I know, he's the only one so far. But I think I have no, I have um, I have known a historian uh, by a very good friend of mine, by the name of um, Kurt Gosweiler, a specialist, uh, a, a member of the academy in um, in the GDR. A specialist in uh, he wrote his second habilitation uh, on the uh, involvements of the uh, of the German German bank uh, with fascism and uh, professor Kurt Gosweiler uh, of course he um, he has um, occupied himself as an when he was already an old man he has occupied himself with that speech too and I, I, I think his readings, his writings would also be very important to be taken into consideration. But um, apart from that, it is a, a subject for future historians. And um, I would like to end with a somewhat uh, a positive note. Um, originally, I had wanted to, to play music, but uh, I understand that it was a very bad idea because the, the piece I chose was not um, adequate. Uh, but um, anyway, I would, uh, 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 I would like to end with lines by Bertolt Brecht. Um, uh, um, well, I can't quote him now by heart, but he's saying that um, the times are changing. He is using the image of uh, uh, of the Moldau, and he says there uh, there are, uh, huge stones are lying on the ground of the Moldau, but they are moving, and uh, uh, emperors are being um, uh, have found uh, their grave on the grounds on the, the 
grounds of the river Moldau, but uh, time has gone over them. And the mighty ones, even if they come along like uh, bloody cutterels, their times, their time is limited, and it will be over. Um, uh, it will be over soon. I mean, uh, it's very poor translation, but the essence is, um, and I feel that very strongly that the balance of power. Uh, between the, the mighty ones in this world are changing now with every day at a enormously uh, uh, enormous pace. And we are seeing a more constructive forces on the horizon. And according to, to my uh, profound uh, uh, um, analysis and understanding, as far as my judgment goes, these forces are exactly to be found there where we supposed to see our enemies, namely in Russia, in China, in Iran. And uh, uh, these nations have been fed also with the uh, black milk of propaganda as we have. But the black milk of propaganda has been spoiled on them because probably they have been so much suffering under the boot of the oppressor that they, their nations have found ways out of the, uh, the mental cage or the mind control system uh, 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 of this poisonous black milk of propaganda. Anyhow, I think if we want to survive as humanity, if, you, if we really want to contribute to build a better future, to build, to, to to build a future based on real democratic and human values and, and um, uh, cooperation. We have to take the hand that is being reached out by Russia, China, uh, with their Belt and Road Initiative, with the Silk Road Project, that already uh, uh, is, uh, has arrived in Germany with the uh, uh, Düsseldorf uh, being the greatest uh, um, inner, uh, um, I don't know the word now, well, a very important uh, um, place of, of um, hub. Commercial, commercial hub, hub, uh, hub, thank you, hub, uh, hub for commercial uh, exchange and exchange and so on. And I want to draw your attention to another positive um, outlook. And that is, uh, that has to do with Christmas. When we, when we try to dismantle, um, when we try to dismantle false narratives and, and, and um, false myths that have been imposed on us, we should also watch out for positive metaphors uh, that also have been downtrodden lately. And I think the image of the uh, Christian um, uh, uh, legend of the, of the, the baby in the cradle uh, that was uh, born in a shabby shade by Mary and Joseph um, uh, in the middle of darkness and despair remains a positive, uh, a positive metaphor, no matter whether you are Christian or Buddhist or Muslim or whatever, the, the metaphor in itself is, is, um, can be shared by everybody. And uh, it is very important in these, um, in these um, uh, somewhat um, desperate times where we are being um, muzzled and mind cuffed and uh, kept separate from each other and have to uh, take a, a resort to only Zoom conferences. We cannot meet physically. We need positive images and metaphors. And uh, uh, as it is uh, the Christmas season, I, I, I like uh, that symbol of, of the baby in the cradle and uh, uh, the fact that it was born to very poor people and they were not even married. And uh, there were this only the, the well, um, those who uh, who's, who were forced to work outside uh, the the I, I don't know the the, na the name in English the, the, help me the the 
those who were guarding the, the herds, the sheep, the shepherds, the shepherds uh, to, to, to come and uh, participate and, and celebrate, and of course, later the three kings. But um, I want to thank you for your attention, uh, and I hope I didn't speak too long and too little structured. And um, thank you very much. I wish you all a good Christmas. <laughs>